Welcome to another Hubble Meet the First Author. Um, my name is Ron Kwan, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Washington. I'm very pleased to be here with Dr. Daphne Cherry, who was a U.S. Department of Education, I Care for Healthcare fellow, as well as an NSF GK12 fellow at Drexel, and is now a provost postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and a newly minted AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Um, she's here to talk about her paper entitled Early Changes in Cartilage Paracellular Matrix Mechanobiology Portend the Onset of Post-Traumatic Osteoarthritis, uh, which was just published in Acta Biomateriaalia. Uh, mm -hmm. Daphne, welcome. So great to have you on here. Hi, Ron. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, talk to you guys about the paper. <laughs> um, so can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, hello. I enjoy long walks on the beach. <laughs> um, like you said, I am a postdoctoral fellow over at the University of Pennsylvania, where I work with under the guidance of Dr. Robert Mock. Um, I've my PhD work was mostly on cartilage. I've now transitioned more to meniscus work. So seeing how changing the mechanical environment of menisci um, uh, in turn affects their uh, chondrocytes activities. Um, and in August, I will be transitioning, um, taking a little sabbatical and going over to Washington DC where I'll be a triple AS science and technology um, policy fellowship working with the Department of Defense um, basic research. Uh, they have a program there that's geared towards um, basically making the STEM uh, curriculums and STEM departments at a historical black um, colleges and universities stronger, so. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, that's a really cool academic journey, which I'm excited to talk about. Um, so uh, just, so well, we can start with the paper. Okay. And um, so this paper came out from your PhD work. Yep. And it was trying to understand the pathology of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Um, so I guess, can you tell us a little bit about sort of what was known about its etiology and, and why you chose specifically to look at changes in the paracellular matrix? So um, there was a student previously in um, Lynn's lab. So I, I worked with Dr. Lynn Hahn over at Drexel University. Um, and she probed um, intact cartilage with the atomic force microscopy. So she looked at the mechanics of, um, the, of cartilage after DMM surgery, which is destabilization of the medial meniscus. And she started seeing changes in the mechanical property as early as one week after DMM surgery. Now, usually when people look into OA, especially the knee cartilage, they usually use semi-quantitative um, histological assays, such as Mankin score. However, Mankin score wasn't able to see any changes um, with the uh, histology until about four weeks after DMM surgery. So she saw it as early as one week. So that was impactful because it showed that AFM was a sensitive tool that can be used to probe the mechanical environment of, um, of OA, of cartilage during OA. So I, knew, I had that idea. And then I started learning about the pericellular matrix, which is this micro domain that completely surrounds chondrocytes and separate them from at the extracellular matrix. Um, and um, started reading a lot of papers from um, different groups. Um, and I was reading how the PCM was known to be more susceptible to OA. Um, that there was a study where um, the PCM lacking key uh, uh, collagen 6, which is the key biomolecule of the PCM, was pushed susceptible to OA. And also they uh, had increased metabolism of the PCM compared to the, the rest of the extracellular matrix. And to me, that was like, oh, okay. I, I hear all these things about the extracellular matrix, but there's this other microdomain that's getting no love, right? <laughs> so I decided, um, Lynn and I decided to probe the PCM to see, um, we already knew that it was susceptible to OA, but is it a casualty of OA or does changes start occurring first at the PCM as opposed to the TIT ECM? And this is where we adapted a technique that was developed by Dr. Gillack's group 
where we were able to combine the immunofluorescent scope with the atomic force microscopy in order to delineate the um, moduli of the PCM from that of the TIT ECM. Um, so that's kind of how it was all birthed. And of course, it grew. Um, the paper grew a little bit, and we started looking into the mechanobiology. And also, if uh, and the, the mechanobiology and the activities of the chondrocytes, and also if we rescue the PCM, will that in turn delay OA or revert it back? Um, yeah. So, 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 so yeah, so that's really cool to, to know the history about this paper. So, so what did you guys find out actually? Oh, well, <laughs> so we found that as early as three days after um, CMM surgery. So again, previously I told you that intact cartilage, so blindly indented on cartilage, we started seeing changes at one week after surgery. We found that when we started delineating the mechanics of the PCM from the TIT ECM, as early as three days after surgery, we started seeing changes in the mechanical properties as compared to the TIT ECM, which remained unchanged. And of course, over time, both the mechanics of the PCM and the TIT ECM both started changing. Um, we then looked into the how is the change in mechanics affecting the way these chondrocytes are signaling um, the changes to the mechanical um, environment by doing calcium signaling. Um, and at three days, we didn't really see much change in the isotonic condition, but once we stressed it uh, by osmotic stress, by changing the from isotonic to hypotonic, we started seeing um, a change in the way that these cells were behaving. And that just pronounced as, as OA, um, went further. So we good for three days to one day to two weeks to eight weeks. So then we were like, okay, um, we did also look at the integrity of the PCM and that was still intact. The, uh, we did IF, we didn't do anything like um, to see if there was any fragments or not, but we just looked to see if the PCM was still intact at the later stages of OA uh, at eight weeks and it still was. So then we're like, okay, well, we do know that it is more susceptible to metabolism. What if we rescue this um, rescue the PCM by uh, using an inhibitor, an MMP inhibitor, um, and slowing down agrokinase. So do we see a, does it, is it rescued, is it saved? Are the mechanical properties um, more or less like the control than um, the, the full CMM lean? And we found that there was, uh, in fact, oh, wow. a rescue effect. Yeah, yeah. So that's really exciting. So it sounds like you found not only this really early change um, that was happening in the mechanics of the paracellular matrix that um, actually was happening before any changes that was happening that were detectable anyways in the surrounding territorial yeah. ECM and that is linked to changes in um, <coughs> calcium signaling in chondrocytes and that if you um, inhibit this change in the paracellular matrix but actually you can then in, in turn um, rescue the changes in chondrocyte signaling, which is, I mean, that's just like, that's so exciting. So how do you see this line of work going now? And, you know, I was wondering, I'll, I was wondering also if you can talk a little bit sort of what you think is going to be the most sort of scientifically or clinically in, impactful aspect about this work. Well, for, for sure, the study identified that the reduction of the PCM was one of the earliest, um, the reduction of the micromodulus of the PCM was one of the earliest events that occur. Um, so I think that that can now be targeted for therapeutics um, and also maybe reversing OA, finding the fact that we saw that by um, slowing down the, the, the inhibiting the MMPs, we were able to actually rescue the PCM. So I think that can be um, used for sure for therapeutics in the future for when we're trying to cure OA or even regenerate cartilage, um, any of those things, which is, you know, it's big in the ortho world <laughs> we're trying to do, so. Um, so, so that's great. Um, so, um, it'd be great to talk a little bit sort of about where, where you're heading next and what's on the horizon for you. And so you mentioned that um, you're going to be starting this AAAS uh, Science that's and Technology Policy Fellowship in Washington, D.C. Um, um, what's that going to entail? So I'm really, really excited about that. So um, the fellowship is a one year. So technically, I like to think of it as a little sabbatical for, for research. Um, and they like to talk about it as where science and policy intersects, right? Um, I've been the recipient of several fellowships. 
Um, I've also been a black woman in the STEM fields. So I've seen firsthand, I've been, I've, I've seen firsthand what policy can do, how policy can help. Um, and I would like to learn a little bit more about how um, I can use the knowledge and my own experience to uh, maybe better policy, a, a little bit better, make it a little better for us. Um, so uh, the fellowship, the fellowship and the department that I'll be working with will be centered around STEM diversity and inclusion. Um, the DLD does have an initiative where they want to diversify their workforce. Um, and they feel like one of the best places to recruit from would be historically black colleges and university and minority serving institutions. Um, however, the best way to make sure that they have um, a, an equivalent education as those that come from predominantly white institute would be to funnel money into their curriculum um, and funnel money to their faculty, their students, um, fund, their, fund their research, um, and give them the support that they need in order to be successful in the STEM field. So that's what I'll be doing with the DOD. Um, I don't know exactly what my direct role will be, but um, I'm definitely excited to be on the side of um, creating policies that will retain and recruit um, minorities into, into this field, for sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um... So I think it's a good reminder too that we need to train not only to be good scientists, but also good leaders and educators as well. And so, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing um, this path that you're taking. Yeah. And, and thanks for taking the time to discuss your work today. Um, uh, we hope okay. to hear more from you in the future. Yes, 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 you will. <laughs> um, so we'd like to thank the audience for taking the time to join us today. Um, if you would like to follow Daphne's journey, be sure to follow her on Twitter. What's your Twitter on handle? Twitter, Daphne Cherry Four, and Cherry is French, so it's one. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would like to be involved in the Meet the First Author Initiative, please feel free to reach out to us through um, Hubble.org, and keep an eye out for us um, at um, upcoming musculoskeletal meetings. And finally, follow Hubble on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. All right, uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for having me.